Okay, so this is an interview for my science fair project and it's going to be on make your kits. Okay, cool. So I have 10 interview questions for you. All right, we can get started. Yeah, let's get going. Okay, so how long have you been in the maker community? Um, I guess I've been a part of the uh, some maker community for our, you know as long as I can remember. Like we have this hacker space here locally called Heatsink Labs, and I've only officially been a member of that community for the past couple of years, where I actually paid dues and stuff. But I've been attending that for, you know, I don't know as long as we've had meetups and stuff, maybe five or six years or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my second question is, do you know what a maker is? Uh, yeah, my definition of what a maker is, is someone who um, who's, has passion to, to do something outside of a uh, work constraint. So a lot of times people make things and do things because they are being asked to do it because of their work. Like to me, a real maker is someone who uses wood or metal or, you know, um, uh, um, like computer parts and little hardware pieces or whatever, and like all of the other bits to make something. And their motivation isn't just work. Their motivation is that they just have a passion to do something and solve their own problem. Thank you for your answer. So the third question is, what maker kits do you usually use? Um, I have a ton of stuff. What's funny is I have all these boards just sitting on my desk. Like I had these tiny tiles that I was, that I messed with because Intel gave me a whole mess of them. So we use these for some workshops that we run. And I have a little Leonardo board just sitting here. And I was trying to find some other thing. I have, uh, I have this, uh, like these little robots. I just have, there's all kinds of junk just sitting around here, but generally I'm a big fan of doing like, there, there's lots of different boards and lots of different things you can use to do a job. Generally you have boards that can run an operating system, like a Raspberry Pi is sort of like a little mini computer that's running Linux and it has a, a preemptive operating system and it has pins that can read, you know, inputs and and then outputs or whatever, and you could turn lights on or do whatever the, you might want to do. But um, uh, th those those have a good use case. And other boards like the uh, microcontroller, like a uh, an Arduino board, those also have a use case where it's a much smaller subset. You don't have an operating system usually, and you you know you're trying to do something simpler. So like right now, I had like I actually put Christmas lights up outside. And I put these LED Christmas lights that are individually addressable. And I just used a little, like in this case, I used a tiny tile, but the code would have worked on any uh, embed, any board that I could program with the Arduino software. And um, it's just, you know, just turning the lights on and off in some pattern or whatever. And I, every once in a while, I think of a new pattern and I'll edit it or whatever, but it's just red and green LEDs going on and off. It's not that, it's not even that big of a deal because I'm just, been messing with it and every year I hope to make it a little bit better and like improve upon it a little bit but my dream is that there's just lights that exist up there that you don't really notice and then for like Halloween I can make them orange and purple or something and then for you know for Christmas the lights will turn on and they'll be red and green and for you know uh, New Year's they'll be red white and blue and then like they'll look like a little like, like little fireworks or something or you know what I mean like they'll be a little different pattern that goes and it's you can do all of that work just on a little tiny board so I tend to use the board that works for the job and but I preferred you know writing like easy um, uh, code in the Arduino IDE like I don't know I, I wish I could share my screen or something but I, I prefer to do that kind of stuff over the Raspberry Pi generally okay so the fourth question is what programming languages do you usually use with the maker kits that you use uh, yeah, so so gen since I use the the Arduino a lot, and I use those kinds of boards that work in there, they have a they have a language that kind of looks like C. So you write a lot of stuff in C, and I don't you don't even have to write a lot of stuff. Like a lot of stuff's been written for you, and you kind of work off those examples and 
and play around with it. So it's not even that complicated to get to know or whatever. But I also am a big fan of the web. So I try to interface the stuff that I do with web things. So uh, I write JavaScript on the website and the JavaScript, uh, web, like what's cool is Chrome. With Chrome, you can connect to a Bluetooth device. And so you can write some code in JavaScript and it can send a command through Bluetooth to a board and tell the board to do something. So a lot of times when I'm working on these things, half of it is in some website in JavaScript and then the other side is in, is in the device using the C-like language. I don't even know what it's called. Like they have, peop different people call it a different thing. I don't know, what, it just looks like C to me. So I, that's what I call it. Okay, so the fifth question is, how many programming languages have you used? Oh man. I never really counted up how many, I mean, I, I've used a lot of them, but then it's like, then it's like, how many am I proficient in or how many, you know, how many am I good at? And I don't, I don't know. I just, I want to just say a number like seven or something, just some random number because I don't know. There's, there's, you know, over the years you, you know, you start out doing one thing and then as the years go by, you can't help but get some, at least some exposure to a whole bunch of programming languages. So. I mean, I don't know. I guess I'll go 10. I'm going 10. I want to say 10. Okay. So what are the ages of the kids that you work, work with? Uh, so uh, my wife and I, we do these robotics programs where we like, we teach the kids how to put these here. Hold on. Like they, they, uh, they put together these little robot kits and we buy these, the, the chassis right here from, uh, this one actually was one that my daughter decorated with, with little pom poms and stuff. But we buy these little kits and then uh, the kids like use tiny tiles or Leonardo boards or something else and a, and a motor controller and to get the, the wheels to turn and to uh, interface with them. And we do, we've done this particular workshop you know, maybe 20 or 30 times, like countless times. And the kid, the age of the, of the kids are all the way from, you know, like, you know, 50 year old men all the way down to, you know, like 10 year old um, kids from, uh, from a women take maker conference or something. So their range is really, really big. Like everybody has fun with it and everybody who hasn't messed around with electronics loves it. So the usually the kids I like to I like to I think the kids that actually get it and have a, a good understanding of what's going on are probably the kids that are closer to like seventh eighth grade in high school the kids that are younger they kind of get frustrated and they don't they don't really explore like the they're not really interested in exploring the space they just sort of want it to work and they're they get frustrated really fast so I think that the older kids are the ones that, that get into it and, and really get something out of it. It's been my experience so far, but, but you know, hopefully younger and younger kids are more and more interested in this stuff because we need, we're gonna, this is like the future, right? So. so with each program that you do, how many kids are in the program? Uh, the, um, generally, we, we like to keep it around, um, about it's easier in the room when there's about 20 kids or less when there's more that gets really chaotic and also the you know the robots are kind of expensive and we have to get someone to pay for them uh, other than us if we can and uh so we generally we team the kids up and use about eight robots and have two kids per robot or whatever but it just depends like we've we've just done a whole range of them all over the place but I think 20 people in the room is pretty good. After that, it gets too many people. Okay, so the ninth question is, which maker kit would you recommend for kids that are starting out using maker kits? Um, I, honestly, I one thing that I, uh oh, I'm getting a call. I gotta go uh, stop this call from happening. Uh, one thing I w would recommend kids one, one thing I would recommend and I've recommended to a few people is to do is to sign up for Adafruit's um, quarterly uh, Ada box that they give out uh, or they don't give it out. It costs $60 a quarter or whatever. But in that box, it's like a, it's a, 
They usually have, uh, you know, some basic supplies that will get you going and there'll be enough for you to complete a project. And they, um, and they have really good instructions and really good tutorials online. And it actually is difficult for a kid if they don't have, you know, someone like an adult to help them along and someone who has a little bit of knowledge to, to help them along. Um, uh, but that, that's, that would be my recommendation is to have an adult who also cares about it and can help, you know, work through some of the issues you might run into. Like a really determined kid could probably figure stuff out, but it is very, very difficult to get started because there's a lot of stuff you have to know, like right from the, like there's a lot of things that it comes in handy to know if it doesn't go right. You know, a lot of times when you're working on something, if it goes right, you think, oh, that was really easy. But if you set up some software on your machine and then you get some strange error and then you try to type in a command that you read about for what you're supposed to do and then that gives you an error and one thing after another, it's really difficult to get down to that, the, to get it to work uh, in, that, um, in that initial setup uh, time. So it's, it's one of those things where I like those Adafruit kits because I get a lot of joy out of them and they're kind of a little bit they're a little bit too basic for me usually, but they're still really fun to, you know, uh, for those times where I get a chance to play around with it with my daughter, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the final question I have for you is what experiments would you recommend, recommend for kids that are starting out using Maker Kids? Um, what experience? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I would recommend that kids like get involved in their local, like the, like all these schools have like Lego leagues, like the Lego Mindstorm leagues. They have like, there's all kinds of things like STEM programs as a part of schools that, that, um, that kids who are interested in somehow they find out about them. And then the kids that aren't interested never knew it was happening. So it's one of those things where, you know, your parent and the kid needs to be an advocate for themselves to try to reach out and find those things. I know that even in my own local community, our, our Gilbert Parks and Rec Department has different programs for kids that is outside the school. And the only way to know about them is to just happen to know that Gilbert's Parks, Parks and Rec, you know, ha like does this thing every once in a while and you got to go get the flyer from the community center or whatever. So, I mean, there's definitely programs out there and lots of ways to learn. You just got to keep, you got to keep looking for them and keep looking for those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I thought of one more question. What experiment, like what experiment would you recommend for kids that are starting out using Maker Kits? Uh, I, I think that it's, it sounds silly and, and this is something that a lot of times kids don't appreciate it, but I like the, I like the idea of thinking about all of the different ways to do something as simple as turn on a light switch. Like when you turn on a light switch in your house, normally what you're doing is you're physically connecting two wires together and then that's delivering this electricity to a light bulb and then the light bulb acts as a resistor and then you know photons come out of it because now you turned on a light or whatever um, but that's just one way to turn on a light switch what are other ways you could turn on a light another way to turn on a light might be through uh like if you have an embedded device and you send it you're on your phone and you turn on the light by pushing the button on your phone what happens when you're doing that you know, it's sending command through the cloud. Some hub in your house picks up that command and then it sends a command to an actuator or to a, a relay. And then the relay is the thing that actually physically connects those wires together. So there's like, you know, those are like two examples of turning on a light. And but you could all even think about that even on a, in a little tiny breadboard with a LED and and, and all of the pieces that you might have, like you can turn that LED on multiple different ways. And what are the different ways you could turn it on and really understanding the difference between physically connecting uh, just a battery to an LED and, and the difference between having a light, having a switch or a button and the button, the button could, you know, physically connect the LED, but also the button could, could connect to a different pin on a Arduino board and that different pin could see, oh, he turned the, he closed the button here. So what I'm gonna do is go, um, 
turn the light on, turn the LED on. So like the, instead of going directly by physically connecting the wires, it went through the Arduino controller and then it turned on the LED. So I, I think that that simple thing, like it sounds simple and it's not even that really exciting, but that, that's a good place to get started because once you start understanding that, you can just build from there. And, and next thing you know, you're, you know, the next, uh, you know, you made the next smart home device that everybody wants or who, who knows, you know. <laughs> I'm still, I remember when I first got it started, all I wanted was a little robot that could go up to, you know, my, my uh, let's call it my root beer machine. They could go to my root beer machine and it would pour me a nice quote, glass of root beer and then it would drive itself back over to my chair. That's all I, that's all I ever wanted. And I still don't have that. It still doesn't work. <laughs> Do you have any questions for me about my science fair project? Um, so there's this, the project that you're doing now, is this about, is it about, are you going to do any of this stuff? What are you doing like with IOT stuff and what are you doing with, in the maker community? So what I did was first for my actual project, for my experiment, I created a liquid crystal display um design and i record i um timed it to see which of the three um maker kits that i used i used tessel raspberry pi and arduino and i tested to see which one was the easiest to use and how long it took me to actually make the lcd work with each program that's cool so you got the kit in the mail and you just said okay i'm gonna i want to put on this little screen i want to put my name so you wanted to put your name on there and then you just you said okay i started with this one how long did it take and then you started with the next one and tested how long it took to to do that task mm -hmm. so who won who got the shortest time i'm pretty sure if I look at my information, I'm, yeah, um, let me see. It was, or, okay. It was the, Arduino. That was the easiest one? It was the easiest one for me to do, and it took the least amount of time. It, the other ones, so Raspberry Pi, it took 30 minutes, and Johnny, the Johnny 5 Tesla 2 took 32 minutes, and the Arduino took 21 minutes. Really? You got it working that fast? Mm-hmm. Like, so, you know, did you know nothing about it? Like, how did you get it going? It would take me longer to do that just to connect it all together. Like, what was the, what was the experiment? Like, you, you, have you worked with any of those before? How would you have known so fast how to get, how to execute on that? I mean, just wiring it up would take me 20 minutes. Like, you have, uh, you have an Arduino board, and then you have a little LCD. So, you have, like, two pins for I2C and two pins for powering it or something. So it would take a little time just to put it on the breadboard. Do you have it on? Do you have it right now on a breadboard to show me? Mm -hmm. So this is the. Yeah. See, how could you have done that in twenty minutes? That would have taken forever. Well, there's. Um, I went to a Tesla, it, it's the Johnny Five website, and it has different, um... Well, that one's the Arduino one, though, isn't it? Mm-hmm, and you, and my dad helped me a little bit with some things to help. So, since it was a Tesla 2 website, my dad had to help me a little bit to find which ones to put it in, but I just, um found the little thing that told you where to put it in the breadboard and he helped me connect it to the Arduino, Arduino. and that's 
I'm just saying you gave that 20 minutes. I think it would have taken 20. It would have taken me like two hours just to wire the thing up. Just because like, look at all those little wires. That would have taken forever to figure that out. So I don't understand the, the number, the time, but, but you know, that's, that's up to you to, to, uh, to prove or whatever, you know, but that's cool. That's a fun, that sounds like a fun, you know, a fun experiment. And actually out of those, I would think that the Arduino is the easiest just because it's easiest to get the tooling on your computer to work. Like say you, you got a brand new computer and they said, okay, do this with Tesla, do this with Raspberry Pi, and then do this with an Arduino. Like the Arduino part seems really easy and you run into a lot less issues with Arduino. Whereas with Tesla, you type in the Tesla command and then something doesn't work and you never know what's gonna happen there. And then my with the Raspberry Pi, you need to make sure that you have a computer that can like connect a USB to it. And also, it takes a little while to download. And we had some problems with the programming language with Raspberry Pi. First, on um, it was really easy to program with the Arduino, but with the Raspberry Pi, the programming language was very slow and it sometimes crashed. What language did you use? Was that Python? It, it, yeah, it was Python, but we, it was like the thing where if you connected the Raspberry Pi to a computer, it would show up with, It was some programming language, not a programming language. It was the software that you have to connect that if you connect the Raspberry Pi to the computer, it will start turning on and downloading to the other computer. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, again, the same, like the Raspberry Pi is the same kind of thing where say all you wanna do, you want this board so that when you plug in the board, it'll show your name on the screen after you plug it in, right? So you wanted something simple like that. I don't know what the experiment was, but say that's all you wanted to do. Like with a Raspberry Pi, in order to get it to do that, you'd have to like learn how to tell the Raspberry Pi that when it boots up, it has to run some little Python program that would go and do that for you. And then you'd, so you'd have to learn about initd and how, or systemd or whatever it uses for, for when a Raspberry Pi starts up, because that's like the, it's a part of the operating system. But with Arduino, you just, you know, the program is just built into Arduino and you could probably find an example like right in the IDE that would tell you how to, how to um, get it to put some text on the screen. So you would do that, write it to the Arduino, you know, unplug it, plug it back in. And as soon as you plugged it in, it would just show up. So I definitely agree that the Arduino is probably the easiest one to, to get some, to, to do those simple ex experiments on. I, I mean, that lines up with my experience too, for sure. That's cool. That was a, how, who did, how did you think of that? Did, did Alex help with that? Yeah, my dad helped with that. That was a good, that's a good, um, that's a good ex experiment. How old are you? I'm 11 years old. 11? Wow, that's cool. So like my daughter's six and I can't get her to care. <laughs> Maybe I have to wait a couple more years. How old were you when you started caring about this kind of stuff? I don't know. Um, maybe like five when I got my first like. Um, there was these th there's these things called little bits, and I think I was like five or six when I first got one of them, and that got me into liking programming and things. And now I'm in a first Lego League competition. And actually, in two days, there's going. I'm going to the state competition. Oh, cool! That's cool. First Lego League's neat. So it was, it was little bits, really. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's like look at like check this out. I saw this on, it was like on clearance or it was on some, it was on Amazon. Amazon always messes with me. Your dad probably understands, but they had this little kit like this. See a little bits kit. And I thought, Oh wow. Rule your room. That's so fun. But my, my daughter doesn't care. I can't. I, now I should be interviewing you about how to get, you know, your kids to care about the stuff that you care about. Did you like, you like Legos when you were a kid? 
Yeah, I have a, uh, I, so this is what happened. Um, my dad got me my first Lego kit and I was like, this is so cool. I'm going to keep building them. And then for Christmas, my dad got me a Lego kit. It was a really large one. And then I didn't build like any of it. And my dad and my grandpa built it while I was asleep. Well, so how long ago was that? That was like five years ago, I think. Have you been getting new Lego kits every year? Well, I wanted to. I tried to ask my dad, but they didn't get me one last year. So I think I'm with the rest of some of my money that I have, I'm going to buy another Lego kit. So in your whole life, you're 11 years old, and your whole life you only have two? No, I don't only have two. I have many Lego kits because during those, like, last year was the first year that I didn't get a Lego kit. So every year I pretty much got like one or two Lego kits. And now um, my basement, I have a Lego box that's filled with Legos. And then I have a, my, I have a couple like shelves that I, ha that I put the Lego kits on. And yeah, I have like seven or eight Lego kit, actual, like actual Lego kits. And then I have a couple boxes of just random Legos. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> That's a little better, but still my kid's only six and she probably has, I mean, she hasn't built them all. Like we've built them because it's fun, but like all, you know, the Disney princess castles, have you seen those? Mm -hmm. Yeah. She has all of them. Like just all of like, if you look at a Disney castle and you see it as a Lego set, we have it, all of them, because they're fun. I like putting them together, but I hope that later on she'll want to put them together. But right now it's still, like I said, she just doesn't, she doesn't like them like I do. Well, thank you for letting me talk to you. For sure. It was fun. Thanks. <laughs> Is your dad still in the room? Mm -hmm. Has he been listening and laughing the whole time? Probably. <laughs> All right, you want to stop recording, Sid? Yeah. You just hit stop. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had it, right? <laughs>